technology. Um, I shared an office with Kujun for many years. And, uh, he came down for eight years uh, for a conference. Uh, it's been a privilege to have him come and write today. And Ram attended uh, two PhD students. Um, Amazing work, and I told the world about it. So, uh, please. Okay. Um, I think, thank you very much. Um, I think the presentations will take like one hour in total. Would that be okay? Not too much? Or? You can make it short, that's better. Okay. <laughs> and I'll try to make it uh, uh, to the presentation within one hour. <laughs> Uh, I will present uh, uh, a kind of overall uh, image of our faculty, the industrial design uh, in Anhui University of Technology first, and then I will try to briefly talk about my work related project, and then Brown will introduce his work and Harry will introduce the presentation about his work, and uh, I will briefly uh, talk about one of the projects in more details. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to show a stand, standard movie. But before I start with the movie, I, uh, as Christoph said, I've been working with Christoph for a lot of years. Um, uh, we are also uh, good friends in the private life. So if you want to know any secrets about Chris, Christoph in uh, his professional and private lives, and you can uh, contact me. Uh, next video I'm going to show is a kind of a, a PR video that uh, we try to use this video to uh, attract more students uh, to uh, the design <coughs> studies. So it gives a kind of overall, overall image, a good overall image about uh, the faculty. So I, then I don't have to talk, I just uh, sit back and uh, let's watch the video. <laughs> the faculty. Um, actually what makes the uh, industrial design faculty in Andalpen kind of special uh, from other uh, design studies is that as you could saw from could see from the video uh, this study is more uh, technical oriented. So what the faculty says we are uh, uh, training the designers who are going to create intelligent systems products and the related services. Uh, so it's not traditional industrial de design work with only the forms, but more with the behavior also in the product and also from a system perspective. Um, I've been working in the faculty as assistant professor now for nine years. I get promoted to so I guess <laughs> I'm not getting stuck there. Um, my background is computer science and uh, human-computer interaction. Actually, I did uh, the same education as Christoph did uh, in Eindhoven uh, in the area of user system interaction. But I have a more te technical uh, influence to my own kind of interest. So what I'm going to next to show you is the projects that 
other is done by me or I participated. I'm, I'm personally I'm very much interested in kind of um, to look at how the physical world is influenced by the digital uh, world that we're creating and vice versa. So how does it uh, uh, influence the, the design? Um, when I talk about the digital world and physical world, and I often said there's opportunity for the designers to manipulate the boundary between the digital world and the, uh, the physical world. And people also often ask, well, what do you mean by manipulating? There are actually a few aspects uh, we can look at it. You know, talk about manipulating the boundaries of uh, the physical and the digital. One of the, way, or one of the ways is to blur it. Um, this is a master project uh, done by master students, which, uh, in which that the student try to create a kind of digital world which is uh, identical to the physical world. And then in this digital world, there's kind of a, a, a virtual creature living in this environment, and children can play with it, interact with it um, in this uh, environment. Because it's coupled to the physical environment, it requires children to uh, physically move and interact with the digital objects in this environment. In order to see it, actually to hear it, because in this uh, in this screen, you don't see any display. We use a kind of audio uh, finder, search through the space to, to talk to or to listen to the uh, digital objects. That is one of the ways to manipulate boundary to just to blur them. So in this application, that's very hard to identify where the boundary is, where the actual interface is. Um, another way of um, uh, manipulating the boundary is to augment in both directions um, the digital world or the physical world. At the left, there's an example to use digital uh, physical objects to augment the digital memory, digital pictures, and and people can play with the digital memory by playing with the physical object to give kind of physical handle to the digital uh, objects. On your right side is the uh, uh, augmenting physical environment. One of the examples is to actually put the digital information into the physical environment by, for example, uh, digital arts, artistic lighting. Here, the example actually it couples to the to a video image which is recorded uh, in real time and is shown with the uh, artistic lighting, which are the movement, the color composition, with distorted form. So if you if you, if you don't know this uh, this coupling, um, when you step into the environment, what you can see is the only kind of colorful lighting. But if people know this is coupled to a kind of video, people will perceive the movement. Sometimes they see color, uh, the color composition of the lighting. They will kind of guess the environment uh, where the video is recorded. Real time. Mixing mixed realities. I think here we do a lot of uh, augmented reality in uh, lab. Um, one of the projects we have done, and also Christoph participated when he was in Eindhoven, is a project called uh, uh, Alice Adventure in Wonderland, where we try to implement uh, the experience of Alice when, he, when she um, traveled into the underground world and he encountered a lot of uh, strange things. There she uh, has to had to go down into a rabbit hole and being in a room, being getting bigger and smaller, and try to swim with a rat and uh, this and that. And there we implement the six stages of uh, stages of them. We utilize all kind of uh, mixed reality uh, installations. I will show you some pictures later. Connecting. Um, physical and digital objects. 
that's actually the topic um, Bram and Riyad will talk about later in details, so I just skip this part. Crossing realities, and um, when you fly from one place to another, especially from Europe to uh, New Zealand, it takes a lot of uh, mental effort to actually adjust to everything. How to make this process smoother, especially in a kind of uh, transitional environment like airplane, how to adjust the lighting, how to adjust the entertainment content to uh, reduce the stress, to make people feel more comfortable with the, with the, uh, the time change and everything else. So this is one of the projects we, we have done there uh, recently. We actually um, made a kind of fly simulator, a very cheap one. The whole thing is sitting on top of four air balloons, which are kind of controlled by uh, um, using compressed air, so that it can be uh, charged and discharged uh, to simulate the taking off and landing experience. Uh, we could also use uh, some big motors to simulate the, the uh, turbulence, etc. And then we could do certain experiments, actually lock, lock people up in this environment, for example, for 12 hours to simulate the long of flight in order to do certain user experience studies. Now, this is an Ellis project. Now we know we actually have a new PhD student working on it, actually working on a software architecture for controlling this kind of uh, environment. Um, in this picture, you could see there uh, all kind of mixed around. The first one is actually a robot. Look like a rabbit, but it, it is a robot sitting on a robot platform. Uh, when Christoph was still working in Hanover, this robot was not actually automated. It was all remote controlled. It's remote controlled car <laughs> with a rabbit put on top. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's a rabbit hole, and there's a, a, a five-sided cave. And the caterpillar is a, uh, a robot, but sitting on there, it does not move at all. But the head can could, could change, and the eye, with only one eye could look at people according to where the sun is from. Uh, the treasure pad is actually a projection, a back, back projection in the dark within in the, the grass to simulate or in the trees to simulate the thing because it's very hard to simulate the appearing disappearing of the Cheshire cat of this cat. So this cat. So that was at least installation. We are still working on it after Christoph left. We got a new place and uh, it's very hard to actually to set it up again. This is a flight simulator I just uh, uh, explained. We actually went to the uh, a kind of flight airplane junkyard in France to collect all kind of pieces of the airplanes in order to make it when you enter it look and feel real. Did you see when it's working? I'm seeing it over the sun. And this is actually a vision studio set up by Christoph. After Christoph left, I had to, I had to take it over. Now it's handed over to another person, which is actually very um, a big seven by three by seven uh, screen with uh, with front uh, projection, where you can actually do experiments with uh, interaction with big pictures, things such as theater. And we recently just graduated one PhD or two PhD students. This is a recent one. Um, I was one of the, one of the supervisors, supervisors, and Christoph is another. Um, actually, he, he was one of the PhD students of Christoph. And when Christoph left, I had to take over because ever since Christoph left, I had to take over. I just had to do a lot of work. 
And in this one, it's actually this project is about connecting uh, the robots to the digital world to use to utilize physical robots as embodied in, uh, interface to the uh, virtual world. And the metaverse is actually a European project which tries to uh, come up with protocols to connect different virtual worlds. Um, the protocol is called MPEG V. They're still working on it. It's not MPEG 5, but MPEG V. V stands for virtual realities, virtual worlds. And SOFIA project is uh, uh, also another European project. It stands for Smart Objects for Intelligent Applications. Sounds very cool. Um, I think Brown will talk about it later in detail, so I just skip this part. You see these two architecture exhibits. Royla, Robotic Interaction Language, one of the PhD, uh, one of the PhD students of uh, of Christoph that I, I had to take over. <laughs> And I think some of you have also, uh, also involved later to writing up the uh, training material for the Rola language. So it took an, a different approach uh, towards uh, human-robot interaction. Usually, we try to improve the robot to better understand human language. And this is the other way around. We design language for the robot to be uh, easier for the robot to understand, but for people they have to pay a little bit of effort to learn how to design such a language, what would be the consequences to uh, people who are learning it. That was actually the PhD research. If you're interested, I think Christoph has a lot to tell. Talking tangibles, and this is also a PhD, student, this, uh, PhD project which focuses on the uh, interaction with certain system, not within your attention space, but in your periphery uh, space. You have to sometimes to inter interact with certain things that you don't want to pay attention to. For example, now I don't know how much time I've spent. Maybe I spent only 15 minutes, I will go faster. Now how, to, how do I know this 15 minutes? There's no clock at that time. It could be some kind of design to give you a certain impression of, oh, okay, when did we start? <laughs> <laughs> to give you people inter integration uh, uh, about time, for example, but not in their uh, attention space. Now, hopefully, human computer interaction requires uh, the attention. So how do we utilize the periphery information, not requiring people's attention, still to make interaction possible? And this PhD student has left. He didn't finish the project, but the project was quite uh, interesting. It was to make the environment more responsive to uh, people's behavior. Uh, it's not for interaction, but it's just to adapt, to make the environment more adaptive to what you do, how you behave in such an environment. Uh, recently, I, I moved my research interest towards Internet of Things and uh, also the uh, combination of Internet of Things and social media. So how do we uh, mix the social media life with the physical life we have uh, normally? So one of the approach is actually to use utilize the Internet of Things to put sensors and actuators around in the environment and connect this information which are actually related to the human behavior to social media in order to share or to uh, other to improve or to share your uh, daily experience. And this is one of the examples that done by master student is to actually use a doormat to interact with the uh, appliances in the environment when you enter and leave the house. When you leave the house, you got aware that what is what are the devices are still on, what are the things still uh, operating, whether it's necessary to switch it off. If it is necessary, then how to switch it off with such a simple device? When you come to the house, um, you want to switch certain things on quickly. And what what are the things already on? For example, when you uh, enter the house, maybe uh, certain device has already been switched on by, by yourself, 
remotely use other applications. And uh, this doormat could act as a kind of confirmation when you stand in front of your own door. Okay, the water is hit, the, the bath is ready, uh, etc. etc. And you want to switch on television, then you switch on television, step into the house, everything is ready just by using such a simple device. And the doormat is a good example of how to embed Internet of Things into our daily life. And how interface is designed. If you are interested, you could um, search on the internet just for doormat. You will find it. Here is a scenario where you enter and leave the house. I'm not going to go into details, but that's the information. I skip this one because it's taking too much time. We also work with a lot of health applications. Um, I'm not very much involved, but still I'm quite involved in some of them. Especially for uh, early born babies, uh, how to take care of them when they are still in the incubator, how to make the connection between the baby and parents. You, um, what is being done now in the hospitals. They put a lot of electrodes, actually sticky, stick to the uh, baby's body, which uh, creates a lot of uh, uh, stress to the baby. And this baby later will have problems in development in their later life. What we try to do is to use um, the sensors which are uh, interweaved in the in, into the baby jackets, for example, into the fabrics. Uh, and also to, to, to detect uh, certain signal for uh, for the for the doctors and for the parents, but also put certain actuators into the into the fabrics. For example, to, uh, for this project called Cocoon, to mimic when babies are kind of in a kind of stress, if the mom comes and to hold them, their stress will be reduced. And this jacket is just to simulate that kind of behavior. If the stress is detect, detected and the cocoon or the jacket will come shrink a little bit to give the baby a kind of comfortable uh, hug to reduce the stress. Actually the student got uh, uh, more bonding on this project to further develop it. Tangible social networking, so for elderly it's very hard to use the computers. Now, this one is to actually try to utilize tea boxes because in Holland people are, people like to drink tea together, especially uh, when they get in cold, when they get cold. So the student designed a kind of tea box, but still, there's one problem with this design is that you still see the keyboard. The keyboard is hidden inside the tea box. Something is different. Actually, the idea was to use the uh, the camera which is embedded in the tea box. We want to send a message right away to kind of post it, put it somewhere, and then the message will be sent. You were doing a lot of augmented reality camera recognition, this and that, you know, it can be done, it's quite easy. But certain problem the student could solve, the design students, they could not solve, but put a keyboard in the keyboard. Good example of the bad examples. Uh, here is an example that uh, we do it with a uh, with a master student is to actually connect your heart rate, heartbeat, to something which is meaningful. Um, this application is actually uh, using heart rate sensor. At the in, in the course, we use a kind of a clip to your finger. You don't see this picture because it's on the, on the right uh, uh, hand. It's hidden in there. Heart rate will be uh, detected. It will be analyzed. When you read a book, you might get excited get stressed, etc. And this information will be detected, we show um, at the corner of the book with colors. Could be kind of uh, interesting for people because people, when people are reading the book, they are often isolated in their own stories. In this way that maybe the family can participate, okay, now you get excited, maybe with some comfort.
many of these kind of examples. Um, I think this translation was done last summer. Updated. Um, one of the things which I think is interesting and exciting to do in a, uh, in a design faculty is that all the time we're facing new projects, small projects. And one of the problems is that these projects often are isolated, they're not well connected. So if you want to establish a kind of research line and you want to involve the students, sometimes it's not that easy. Because students have their own interests and you have your own research which interests and you want to attract them to your research interests. Um, it's uh, not that easy. But the good side is that every time you see interesting, interesting project. Okay, that was my introduction. I think Ron, you have to present your work in yeah. five minutes or so. <laughs> oh. So <clears throat> maybe a little bit of background. Um, so I'm a PhD student at it was not turned on. Okay. <laughs> so I'm a PhD student at the faculty. Um, I also studied there, so I did both my bachelor's and my master's there. And now uh, already for three years a PhD. I think actually today is, or tomorrow is my official last working day. So yeah. I'm almost done. I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm graduating this summer, probably, if everything goes well. So, um, Um, this uh, presentation is part of the PhD work of both Gerrit and I, and we presented uh, some of our work during the, the conference uh, last week in, in Wellington. Um, I'll try to make it a little bit more general, uh, so I don't have to uh, go in all the details, because that might take a little bit uh, too much time. Um, so. The project that we're doing with, well, June already mentioned it very briefly, is, is about smart environments. Um, and we see these smart environments as kind of ecosystems of, of objects that connect to the internet or to each other or through the internet to each other. Um, and uh, that they can also interoperate, so they can share content, but maybe also share controls. Um, and the, the objects that we targeted or the products that we targeted in this project is both like objects that are already around, like smartphones and these kind of things, but also uh, we try to focus on, on developing new objects and, and um, also the, the, the rest of the project focused on that. Um, for me personally, I looked also on very specific on the connections and the relations between these objects, so not only the objects themselves, but also um, the relations that, that, that you can make between them and where you can actually do things together. Um, so we kind of uh, then create a way of interacting that is no longer on, on a single object, but kind of goes across the whole system of, of objects and products. Um, very cool name, smart objects for intelligent applications. The Sophia project, like June mentioned already. Um, I will now kind of cheat a little bit and show you a little movie that nicely uh, introduces the challenges of this project. And it's actually not a, a movie by the people from the Sophia project, but by a partner project that is building on the outcomes of the Sophia project. Let's see. People have always found ways to communicate and invent. 
right now, digital technology is pushing that process forwards faster than ever before. The gadgets in our pockets are getting smarter and more powerful as microchips get cheaper. In fact, these chips are getting so cheap that we can put them into all sorts of things. Things we hadn't thought of putting chips into before. That means ordinary, everyday items are changing, becoming smarter and connected to the world around them. Since February 2011, AT&T have had more machine subscribers than human ones. That's things like home appliances, car tracking systems, and machines and factories. By 2020, there could be as many as 50 billion smart devices connected to the internet. As these connected devices become more widespread, they can help us keep fit and stay healthy, make our environment safer and more efficient, and use limited resources in the most efficient way. So as people come to rely more on all this interconnected technology, the more we might start seeing frustration and confusion in unexpected places. So what can we do to plan ahead? There are many challenges to overcome. For example, we need to make sure it's easy to connect everything together and keep it working. Most people don't want to become technical experts. As this technology reaches further into our lives, we need to be sure people feel in control of the devices and services around them. Not the other way round. Once these things become interconnected, we need to be able to move between them in a fluid way. We call this interusability. Finally, we need a better understanding of how to design for this interconnected world. The SmartCos project, involving 17 partners from across Europe, has been set up to look for solutions to these challenges. For more information, or to get in touch, you can... So, un yeah, we're very unhappy that we're not in this anymore. I mean, this, this uh, follow-up project, because this is where it gets really interesting. But we did some of the, of, of, of the preparation work for that. Um, there it is, yeah. So some of the design challenges that were already mentioned, so we have this increasingly number of wireless connections between all the objects and um, we kind of lose track of what is connected to what and, and we also, um, we don't really know what, what is happening anymore. So what we try to do is kind of make this control more, more physical and more comprehensible and by, by uh, creating interfaces to the connections and, uh, and not only using the objects. Um, and, and I think one of the main challenges that we face is that this interoperability as we envision it is kind of uh, what they call serendipitous interoperability. So these smart objects, they were not really designed to work together or not, not let's say, as, as a whole system designed to work together. And yet you want, when you connect them to kind of create a smooth overall user experience, um, so what we've defined is a semantic connection, which is a meaningful connection between two objects. So, um, yeah, I will just read it to you. A semantic connection is a relationship between two entities in a smart environment and focuses on the semantics or meaning of the connections between these entities. And um, the way we kind of see it is we have two smart objects in the physical world and they have a connection, and um, this connection can be any kind of connection. It can be a wireless, uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, doesn't really matter. And we also, we don't want users to be concerned with this. I mean, if you look nowadays, if you want to exchange information between two phones, you have to kind of see, well, can we use Bluetooth? Uh, and what do we have to do to pair? Do we have to negotiate a password? And basically what a user wants to do is they just want to move a photo or a music file. So we kind of, want them to operate on that level and not be dealing with these uh, yeah, nuances of, of uh, the, the, the technicalities. So yeah, we model them by having like all the physical objects kind of also have a 
a digital representation and um, although the work that we are presenting now is a little bit focused above the water in the physical world, um, Gerrit has been working quite a lot on like below the water, let's say the digital domain, how there you can model these connections and, uh, and also the objects. So we defined an interaction model. It's a little bit complicated maybe to explain everything, but maybe briefly, um, as users interact with one of the objects that are connected, um, they kind of, um, their uh, actions are kind of modeled digitally and they, are, they move across the objects. And what we also made sure is that as they operate on one device, also the types of feedback, or the, the feedback that they get is also nicely showing up on the, the connected devices. So they kind of get an idea of, of, of how the, the relationship between these objects are. And we did a lot of uh, testing also with users to see whether they can actually grasp these connections and we kind of investigated their mental models as they were interacting with them. Um, we also looked at what it means if you make a connection and kind of if you say, okay, this connection has a directionality, what does it mean for the information that is exchanged and for the user interaction that uh, comes with the connection? And also what if you connect uh, an object called A to B and B to C, do we also have transitivity? And is that something that users can also still understand? Um, what we draw upon is a theory of product semantics. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it basically describes how, or as the study of how objects uh, and products can acquire meaning. And we kind of employ these because they are, this is what kind of designers employ to communicate what a product is or and what it can do. We kind of draw upon the overlap in meanings of, let's say, two connected objects. So here you see a iPod and a stereo set. And for users, uh, conceptually, these things belong together. I mean, they are uh, in the same product family. They have something to do with meaning. So they kind of expect already something to happen in terms of music exchange when they, they connect these things. And that's where we kind of see this yeah, emerging functionality between the and the overlap of the two objects. And we also looked at how um, the feedback and feed forward, which is the uh, information that the user receives before they act, how these things change when you interact with a whole system of, of interconnected smart objects. And um, we basically applied a framework called the Frogger framework, which uh, explains and also analyzes how you can use different types of feedback and feed forward to maintain a nice link or a good link between the user actions and the, uh, the, the, the product's functions. Um, where we kind of treat the uh, inherent and augmented feedback and feed forward as kind of more about the how and the uh, functional and augmented feedback as, as what an object can do. And uh, with inherent, augmented, and functional, it kind of, uh, it explains where the source of this information comes from. So inherent feedback and feed forward is feedback that comes from the action itself and from the, uh, the controls itself. So buttons kind of have a uh, inherent feed forward, which is close to uh, the term affordances. So you kind of feel that you can press it and also inherent feedback means that you f get feedback from this control inherently. And um, augmented feedback just means that it comes from an additional source that is kind of augmented onto the, the, the real world. And the functional uh, feedback and feed forward is about the real function of the product. So functional feedback would be, I press the <coughs> light switch and I see the light go on, something like that. And what we kind of looked into is how these things change when it happens over uh, distributed objects. Um, yeah, maybe this is a little bit too much detail, but um, what we kind of see is that the inherent feedback and feed forward, they are kind of physical, so they, they stay where they are with the object that um, you're currently operating with. But the augmented and functional uh, feedback and feed forward, they kind of are more in, in, the in the digital world and they kind of emerge more from the digital world. And 
So you can also see that these types of information, they kind of travel over the connections. Um, maybe I stop here and you keep this in mind and then you watch Gerrit's presentation and you <laughs> can kind of see how we, uh, how we implemented this. Okay, hi guys. Um, yeah, I'm Gerrit Niesen. Um, I'm also almost finished with my PhD, but I still have to complete the thesis. So uh, hopefully by the end of June, I will also have a thesis and also be done with my, my PhD. Uh, my background is in computer engineering. I originally studied in, in South Africa, and I'm also now at the University of Antwerp. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I will uh, try to do my 20 minute presentation in 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to, to skip a lot of stuff, but uh, hopefully still get to the essence of the actual presentation. Um, basically what I want to do is to uh, look at two approaches that we use to um, see how we could implement this idea of semantic connections. So that you have a very simple way of um, exploring connections uh, between devices, make these connections, break existing connections, um, and also how you would then exchange information between the devices on a very high semantic level so that you, that you're not, you don't have to worry about the low level details whether you're using a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi implementation. Just the fact that you want to use this device to control that device or you want to exchange information from this device to that device uh, should, should be enough. So we looked at two approaches. We looked at both a tangible and an augmented reality approach that, that I quickly want to discuss with you today. Um, the tangible approach uh, we do with the device that we call the connector object. It is basically a uh, small microcontroller with a RFID module and a, a small Bluetooth module that is inside the device. It consists of the one there on the left that consists of two interlocking modules. And what you can do is, is you can scan different devices. Um, and when you scan the first device, uh, it shows you on the first inner LED segment whether it recognized the device. You can then walk over to another device and scan that one. And it will either show you whether a connection is possible by flashing a green lighting pattern, or it will show you that there is an, connect, uh, an existing connection, so it will show a solid green light, um, or it shows you a red um, uh, light at the top showing that a connection is not possible. If you have an existing connection, you can actually pull on the two pieces uh, to break the connection, or if the connection is possible, you can push the two pieces together um, in order to, to, to make a connection. Uh, so the idea is basically uh, based around uh, the, the idea of, of, of a magnifying glass uh, that you can use to look at devices in the environment. And it allows for a nice exploratory approach to, to, to these connections. Um, here you can see where we're actually scanning a, a lighting of us. You can see the, the lights uh, light up on top of the, the, the connector object. Um, then our other approach that we're going to look at, or that we looked at, was the uh, augmented reality approach. And here we use the device called the uh, Spotlight Navigation Device. And basically what it is, it is a Pico projector that has also a small microcontroller inside. It has a, um, and it has an inertial measurement uh, unit or, or a motion sensor inside. So it knows its exact location in space. And what's nice about that is you can actually then point it at a device. And when you point it at that device, it knows its location in space, so it projects an icon of that device right next to the object. And you can then, using a click and uh, drop approach, um, you can kind of click and drag a, uh, a line between two devices and in such a way make a connection. So you, you can see an, an example of that happening where on the left we have a lighting device with, with the icon of, of the lamp, and on the right we have a speaker and you can then kind of click and drag with your Pico proje projector between them and create a connection. We also use similar semantics so that a red connection means it's not possible. Uh, you can also break connections by, by shaking the device when you have an existing connection between, between the two. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what we did is during the, with the Sophia project, we had quite a number of partners involved um, that we all 
had this ex experimental setup together. So all these devices are from different companies and different manufacturers. So kind of the, the we, we kind of tested it to show both that the software architecture that we developed uh, works to allow devices from different manufacturers to, to communicate with one another. But also um, my focus was more on how you would go about describing the capabilities of, of the, these devices using um, ontologies and other semantic web technologies. And um, well, I'll, I'll show you a quick video to explain the, the setup um, of all the, the different devices. Um, <clears throat> As part of the SOFIA project, funded by the European Artemis program, a smart home pilot was conducted at the Experience Lab of Philips Research in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. 21 participants were recruited for user study and were presented with the following scenario. When SOFIA enters the room is detected and the functional lighting turns on, SOFIA selects a book from her bookcase and sits down to read, wondering what her two friends, Mark and Dries, are up to. The wall wash lighting in the house of Mark and Dries also turn on when they enter their living room. Sensors on the wall update the semantic information broker with presence information, and the wall wash lighting, being subscribed to these kinds of events, responds when their presence is detected. Mark takes out his mobile phone to play a song for Dries. While they are listening to the music, Mark explains to Dries that the music player can be connected to the lighting device in the room to render the mood of the music. This is achieved using the white connector object lying on the table. There is a tag on the mobile phone that Dries scans using the connector object. Four light segments on the object turn on in sequence indicating that the mobile phone is recognized. Dries walks over to the lighting device and holds it up to its tag, where a second light sequence lights up. The light segments flash green, indicating that a connection is possible, and Dries presses the connector object to make the connection. The lighting device renders a lighting pattern based on the music. Back at her place, Sophia notices that Mark and Dries are listening to music, as the same lighting pattern is rendered on her lighting device as well. She would like to know what music they are listening to, and picks up her spotlight navigation device. As she picks it up, the functional lighting in the room dims down to allow the spotlight navigation to project an image on the wall. Using an augmented reality approach, the light in the sound system is visualized, and she draws a connection between the two using the spotlight navigation device. The same music that is playing at Mark and Dries is now also playing on her sound system. Since users are directly in control of the connections between the objects, Mark and Dries can also break the connection between the mobile phone and the lighting device. Mark scans the phone's tag again using the connector object and waits for the light sequence to complete. He then goes back to the lighting device and scans the other tag. A solid green light indicates that the devices are connected. He then pulls the connector object, breaking the connection between the two devices. The wall wash lighting in the room turns back on. Okay, so basically we had two separate locations set up within the um, experience lab. Downstairs we were testing the, the tangible approach uh, and on the left we had the upstairs setup with, which we used to test the uh, augmented reality approach. And there you can see all the devices including the permanent and the temporary connections that, that we used in the setup. Um, okay, so we performed an evaluation during a week that this setup was running in the, the experience lab. Um, it had 21 participants of an average age of around 28 and a half. Nine were living alone, 11 cohabiting, and they reported their self-familiarity score with interactive systems as uh, six on a scale of one to seven. So uh, what we did was we basically looked at 
uh, how could we elicit their mental models? How we could figure out what, what, how they um, experience the system and how they see it, how it connects to, how all the devices connect to each other. So we recorded these mental models using the teach back protocol, which means we looked at both the semantic knowledge or the what is questions, as well as the procedural knowledge or the how to questions. And um, basically what we did is when they would arrive, we would give them a predefined list of tasks which they had, which they had to accomplish while within the room um, and then thinking out loud while they do each task. Once they complete the list of tasks, they could then still kind of explore the system and make sure that all their assumptions are correct with, with regards to how the system works. And then they had an interview afterwards. So we would um, first have them draw down their mental model and explain how they think the system fits together and then also have an interview with, with a number of questions. Uh, these are some of the results where you can see the, the mental models that some of the, the, the users drew. Um, you can see here, uh, there is the connector object over there and it's, it's basically seen as a part of the system. So it's, it's really just, from the user's point of view, another smart object in the system. Um, it is connected to all the other devices, but they don't see it as a special separate device. It's just another device in the system. You can also see that here there's a question mark above the sensor where in any, in any case where there was something that happened automatically, so that it was an incidental interaction instead of intentional, um, an intentional interaction that the user made, uh, they had much more trouble to visualize how this would fit in together with the rest of the system. Uh, here's another example of, where, of a mental model where you can see this user had a very strong spatial layout of the system so that even though the TV there wasn't part of the system, they still drew it and sh showed the lighting device next to it just because that is where it was located. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so what we did was we looked at a few concepts when, while evaluating the mental models. So we first looked at completeness. Uh, did, the, um, did the users see all the different devices and did they also um, correctly recognize all the connections between the devices? And um, in most of the cases, uh, it was not a problem in the case where there was intentional interaction. But in the cases where there were incidental interactions, so things happening automatically, um, there were some things missing in the mental models where you, they clearly did not understood, understand what was happening. Uh, we also evaluated the semantic connections themselves, or the, the user's concepts of these semantic connections themselves. We looked at things like directionality. Even though there wasn't a concept of directionality in the, in the system itself, users still had a very strong feeling of when I connect this object to that object, it means that I want to transfer information from this device to that device. So they had the strong feeling of directionality while making these connections. Uh, also transitivity, when you have one device that's connected to a second device and that second device is connected to a third device, performing an action on the first device and having an effect on the thir third device would be perfectly normal. Um, even though the first and the third one is not directly connected, this concept of transitivity did not, did not pose a problem. Um, also a priority, uh, even though in our system we did not really have um, a problem or, or any, a, a case where you would have to distinguish between priority between two devices, users immediately thought that, well, already, they already started thinking of how can I solve this problem if I have two devices that are connected to a third device, which one should have priority? Um, and they also clearly distinguish between temporary and persistent connections where some things would always be connected or some things like a friend visiting and their mobile phone uh, being connected to your system, that should only be temporary. When the user leaves and comes back, comes back at a later time, that connection shouldn't persist. Um, we also looked at the organizational layout. So um, basically most of the people had a, a, a spatial layout when they drew these mental models. Uh, there were two users that actually had a more uh, logical network layout approach. We are assuming they were the engineers that took part. Uh, and then for the network structure, uh, we looked at both. Uh, we, there were both uh, concepts of star networks being drawn where everything would be connected to a central object and other uh, users would have a more peer-to-peer uh, -peer approach where each device would be connected to another device. And we even had some hybrid uh, structures as well where they would combine both star networks and peer-to-peer and -peer networks. Um, okay, so to conclude, Basically, most of the users reported that this, they uh, experienced this as being a very simple way of making connections between, between devices. And they, they actually felt that uh, it was, they wanted to be able to connect more devices in, in the room, and we didn't instrument those, so they were a bit frustrated that they could only make connections between some of the devices in the environment. 
then, as I showed earlier in, in the mental model, they clearly saw the connector object as being a part of the system. Uh, also as a way of kind of carrying content between objects. So you could kind of take music from the mobile phone and take it to the speaker and drop it on the speaker. So this connector object was a way of carrying content. Whereas the spotlight navigation was really seen as something that's out of the system. It was kind of seen as a remote control where you can use it to make um, connections between objects, but it was never seen as, 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 as a part of the system itself. Uh, and then, yeah, I've already explained the, the, the difference between intentional versus incidental interaction, where um, in the case of incidental interaction, it, it proved a lot more problematic for, for the user's mental models. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. just present it's not related to the MPEG-3 uh, uh, previous uh, PhD student Christoph is also a supervisor for him we do some work for MPEG-3 uh, whereas actually uh, about uh, uh, the protocol connecting different world to worlds uh, all positioning that project was to uh, contribute from uh, the perspectives of how to connect the physical world to the actually to the physical world. How to, to the virtual world. How to make the connection, how to interface. And one of the approaches that we use is uh, a, a embedded interaction, especially using robots. Or connecting virtual virtual world and the physical world. Physical world. So when you want to connect physical devices, there should be certainly a kind of connection which is below the surface, which connects between the physical devices. What kind of protocol or what kind of? Uh, um, okay, so so within the um, Sophia project, there was a protocol developed called the Smart Space Access Protocol, and uh, basically what it allows you to do is to um, um, share information with a information broker in, in triple format. And uh, you could also then subscribe to, to changes uh, of these triples, um, as well as insert and, and remove information. And that runs on top of a, of, of a TCP IP network. So um, that's, that's kind of how interoperability is achieved, that uh, we assume all the devices to be available on, on a TCP IP network, and then use SSAP to communicate with one another. So basically, uh, all devices kind of to, 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 to a central information broker, yeah, and that, that is also then, then a triple store. So um, the focus of my PhD work is, is to take the, the information in this triple store and figure out how, how it should be stored. Also, how you would store information about um, uh, uh, the, the capabilities of, of the smart objects themselves. And then we use uh, a, a reasoner and um, uh, yeah, we use reasoning technology to kind of figure out if we have triples coming from different devices, how we can uh, figure out how they can be connected to each other. Actually, the back end of technology of the Sophia approach is, is actually the same technology used for uh, Siri, which is the vision of the iPhone, based on this semantic technology, semantic web technology. So in between cheek, because the spotlight thing, I guess they had projections on the walls, and you can do the projections, it seemed like it could be kind of projection communication as well. And if you had, let's say, the remote pointing at the object, that you could look object directly at the projections on the wall, would that be something that would potentially serve between the teeth, which kind of connecting, you know what I mean, directly between object and another object with the remote rather than physically, you know, so so the, the most primitive one, well, the most um, I guess uh, tangible one would be 
take a physical object and make it like connect there. Go to one, you wait, you build one, you wait, and you feel like you're part of the system, right? And the most remote one, you're actually taking, I guess, projection of those things on the wall and doing that indirectly, right? And I was thinking something in between where you're trying to do them directly, but you're doing remote. Right? So you take a remote and maybe it has some object recognition things on the you know, files, and I read model, blah, blah, do that, and do that. And then it's kind of somewhere between walking up to it and doing that indirect thing yep. on the wall. And I was wondering what else did, you know, between those two extremes and whether that's something that yep. a lot of yep. so this, um, Well, originally with this portlight navigation device, that, that was the idea to, to have it kind of pointing it directly at, at the devices. It was more just uh, limitations of, of the technology that, right. that we used at the time to, to um, especially since we had real users that, that had to play with these things, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a clear idea of where something could be connected to something else and was just easier to project it against the wall. But the idea would be to, to actually point it at the device itself. Um, we, we did explore a few other approaches as well. Uh, so what the other slide that Brom had up earlier showed um, uh, our interaction tile. Um, maybe, yeah, I don't know, so maybe show the last one. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. there we have it. Um, so basically we have there on the left the interaction tile, so we kind of had these cubes uh, as proxies for the devices, um, which you can then place them next to the tile and it will show you on the light segments whether they can be connected. And then you can kind of shake the tile to make it or break the connection. And then we have this one here in the middle as well where the cubes themselves can be placed next to each other to show which devices should be connected to one another. But yeah, of course, this one also separates the um, uh, the, the, the devices from the, uh, the these proxy objects, so it makes it also a little bit more difficult to, to, to comprehend. Thank you very much for your time. Well,